I'm Bryce Rosenblum, the Artistic Director at World Music Institute. Such a pleasure to be here today introducing Tandiswa and Farima. Uh, I was in South Africa in 1996 when Bongo Muffin was blowing up and it was amazing to see the response, the reaction uh, among, among the youth, among music lovers. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be able to uh, introduce Tandiswa here. So Tandiswa is one of the most influential post-apartheid singers in South Africa. She began her career in 1996 with music groups Jackknife and Bongo Muffin, one of the pioneering bands of the dance music genre Kwaito. After six award-winning albums with Bongo Muffin, she ventured into a solo career, which has garnered her double platinum status and numerous awards, including the Cora Award for Best African Female and four South African Music Awards. Known for electrifying performances, Tandiswa has performed all over the world at venues including the Apollo Theater, the Lincoln Theater, the Cannes Film Festival, uh, Africa Express, BBC Worldwide Music, uh, Afropunk, Carnegie Hall, uh, Citywide Festival, among others. She has collaborated with artists such as Huma Sekela, Michelle Ndegocello, uh, Fatumata Diawara, Somi, and DJ Black Coffee. Her most recent album, Sankofa, was recorded in Johannesburg, Dakar, and New York, and it combines archival Kosa music, jazz, and West African music, and includes songs produced by Michelle Ndegocello and Duduzo Makatini. With, uh, in collaborations with Tandi Ntuli uh, and Tende Shoko. Farima Konakito is here. She will be interviewing Tandiswa. She is from Burkina Faso, West Africa. She came to the US when she was 18 to attend college and very soon after found ways to flourish with a distinct passion for social justice, storytelling and fashion using her communications major. She approached her work with the ambition to reclaim control over the narratives assigned to Black folks globally and the West African youth specifically. Today, Farima is an accomplished artist, model, writer, and scholar. You can also hear Farima uh, host a wonderful interview with Umu Sangari on our w WMI Plus at Home archives on our website. And you can see Tandiswa in July at Bryant Park this summer. And then also in November, she'll be returning for a concert that we're presenting at Le Poisson Rouge. And I'd love to hand the mic over to Farima. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And thank you so much for accepting this inv invitation. Thank you so So excited to get into it with you. Um, without further ado, let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about this amazing career of yours. And let's talk about this amazing album that just came out, which is Sankofa. Hi, Farima. Thank you for having me. Of course. I love that we're matching with the car. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. No, yes. it's, you know, we have to represent. It's, it's you know, it carries energy, spiritual energy. I believe yes. so. So, yeah. Um. So my first question to you is in relation to your long lasting um career. I mean, I think that you've been doing this for about 25 years. Um, yeah. You are, you know, a conscious artist, a historian, a griot, a storyteller, and I, I'm just curious to know what has kept you going over those, those long lasting years. Um, I think it's, you know, the purpose of my work has always been to, um, I guess, heal myself, you know, I was born during apartheid South Africa, you know, and so um, the work of undoing that, uh, you know, personal traumas as well as collective traumas has been kind of the sole purpose of, of my work. Um, and, um, yeah, I, that's really the thing that keeps me going is, um, that I'm in this kind of, uh, um, journey of healing and rediscovering myself. You know, I, growing up during apartheid, the, the you know apartheid had this mission to um erase us um erase who we are our cultures our languages um and so i use my music to remember and to kind of find ways to um capture those things that might have been lost to us during the struggle uh, for our freedom that is beautiful 
And I can only imagine um, your your journey from the beginning with Zabala to now Sankofa. And um, I'm curious to know, how do you see your relationship with music, have, music having evolved, you know, over the past years? Because the 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 healing process, you know, at the starting at the start of this journey versus I'm sure, you know, where you are now might have transformed over the course of the years. And so how do you how do you um, think this has impacted your um, your sonic language overall? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I really don't like to use these labels, these kind of um, things that define genre, you know, um, especially because I, I started making music when I was really young. And as you said, I was doing Guaido when I was younger. It, it was dance music. And the older I became, the more some of these other influences um, kind of emerged. Um, and so my relationship to the music has always been that of discovery and of, um, yeah, mostly that discovery, finding new ways of, of, of communicating. Um, and so over the years, I guess, the influences of people like Bella Guti and Mira Makeba, um, Kuma Sikela, and a great artist from South Africa called Wusin Klongo, who has since passed away. Um, those influences really started to emerge and they started to um, really, uh, yeah, I couldn't separate them from my work. Um, so, and it's still very much about healing and memory, you know, because the, the, the project of healing oneself is kind of like a long, a lifelong project. Um, we're, we're always a work in, in, in progress. And so um, my work, I use that work as a tool to, um, to decode this human experience um, to, yeah, to understand um, what some of these experiences have meant to me, how they've changed me, and how I can use those experiences to change other people's lives. Mm. Yeah, no, I love your take on on um, generous because I think that a lot of um, artists, me myself included, don't always abide by the categories and and mostly think of um, what are the essentially the tools that are accessible to us and what makes sense to us based on who is part of our community and who inspires us. Um, exactly. on a day to day and and so I find myself very much in in that and there is a certain freedom that comes with that don't you don't you think yeah I agree uh, because also what happens especially when you're an African artist is that um the world really wants to place you somewhere yes they they want to say you are either a folk artist or you are something they want to place you somewhere but I've had such a long career where I've experimented with so many things. I've experimented with punk music, with jazz, with reggae, with, you know, all these things that I encounter along my along the way. And so um, all of them, you find all of these influences in my work and it, it, it can't really be defined by one thing. I wish I, it could. And I think that sometimes my agent wishes it could be <laughs> one thing um but i think that over time i've noticed mm -hmm. and that um it's not really so much about the genre of the music that you're making but what defines your work is how it makes people feel and um over time my work has become an instrument of healing um and of um reimagining of of creating futures, future visions, um, Afro futures. Um, and so in that, um, you know, I almost feel like it, I, I can't exist within one particular genre because I have to transcend that. I have to find ways to be of the future, to be alive in the future, you know? Um, yeah. That makes total sense. I mean, I... I think that it's something that even 
can be felt, you know, through your 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 multiple albums and Sankofa specifically. I mean, it feels like it was it, it's it's an expansive um approach to to music making, to even engaging with history. Um and I love that you 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 mentioned, you know, Afrofuturism and and the the essentially to to an extent the right to um to imagine and allow allow yourself to imagine and create outside of what has been um you know presented as the sole options to to transcend that and then create something that is based on what what you feel like you need for your own healing something that can facilitate yes. your own healing and the people around you so it's it's funny because you know as i was i was listening to your album and i'm sure you know a lot of our um our spectators as well um while when i was listening to it i was just thinking about the fact that i do not understand the language at least the you know the, from a linguistic perspective yes. but i could thoroughly feel the contagious um um courage and the contagious like self love and and self um um power that this album was inviting me to take part in to lean into and yeah. that that is is something that is that is i'm sure very difficult to um to do if you are not in phase with what you resonate with so my question yeah. to you um in terms of um is is more 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 related to what do you find yourself gravitating towards from a sonic perspective but also you know in general like what are the things that inspire inspire you is it water is it fire is it curry shells is it you know like Miriam Makeba is it you, you see what I'm saying yeah what are these um these influences what are the yes. things that call call to yes. me? Mm -hmm. um you know uh having grown up during apartheid in in apartheid South Africa and thinking about this idea of being erased, mm -hmm. I've always been obsessed with finding myself, with collecting pieces of ourselves, you know. And so these are my obsessions. I'm obsessed with um, uh, our history, our languages, um, our expressions of beauty, our expressions of faith, of, um, you know, what is God to us, what is religion yeah. to us what is spirit to us. Those are things that are really um, interesting to me because, um, you know, also when you talk about spirit, especially in music, um, this is something that transcends language, you know? And so yeah. I think that's why when you listen to it, you can sense something more than wanting to, to have a thing translated to you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thing that we say in my language that you know you can't translate our language. We yeah. always it's a it's a I mean I'm I'm translating the saying right now. But the saying <laughs> yeah. is to the, the saying is to say we can't translate. Mm -hmm. Um and that's because language the language is so nuanced, it's so um it's so relies on the spiritual connection between people. Um so yeah, I like to use music and to use these um, sonic uh, um, ingredients to um, to break these boundaries that mm -hmm. maybe language or culture um, can create, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, in order to do that, I do love to travel the African continent. I love to listen to uh, traditional music from all over the continent, listen to the, the drumming, drumming rhythmic patterns, uh, listen to the harmonic structures. Um, and I love to pick at an archive, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I realize now that that's something that I've done, even with my Zawalaza album, I did that. But I love to pick at an archive and bring that archive into, um, into kind of this, into a modern space. Um, and engage in a conversation with that, with this historic archival sound. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with this album, it went even further, I think, because it became three-dimensional in the sense that it also involved the diaspora. You know, mm -hmm. once I came to New York and I was recording with Michelle Ngecello, um, she and the other musicians in the room were responding to this Kosa archive, you know, 
And so there was this kind of three-dimensional conversation about um, who we are, what we love, what connects us, uh, what makes us happy, um, what is this common sonic language, you know, that yeah. we discovered through working with one another, you know. And um, yeah, so these are the things that that uh, that interest me and call to me. But also like, you know, the fact that my our lives are inextricably um political. You know, mm, you you yeah. you cannot separate yourself from the political as an African artist or for me as a, a queer uh woman in Africa. Mm -hmm. Um so these things become they become the cornerstone of of of, of how I express myself around this idea of a pan-Africanism, of a, um, a, uh, uh, a, a rebellion mm -hmm. of all these other things that want to assume that I can exi cannot exist as a Black queer woman, you know? So I use the music to kind of, um, in a way, almost translate those things without yeah. you understanding the music, but to translate this idea of freedom of rebellion of um of being who you are yeah. unapologetically you know and when you're an african sometimes these things can be really difficult to do because yeah. there's an entire world out there that um looks at you in a particular way and mm -hmm. so there's something very radical about an african person who says i'm i'm here like this you know and i'm i'm not going to change my language I'm not going to translate it either. Um, yeah, but that's the thing. Those are the things that uh, that call to me, you know. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And it sounds like um, music is your your um, terrain of experiment experimentation, but it's also um, where it's it's basically a framework. Um, you know, your framework where you yeah. allow yourself to explore things and allow for people to also engage with a new language, a new way of going about. Um, creating a, a, a universe that encompasses their multiplicity that allows for them to be multiple that allows for them to be complex and that is so needed that is so needed yeah, yeah. thank you that's that's and you i know, think it's also just this idea yeah. of us all being human yes um yes. that it's not it's not really about me being from africa or being an african mm -hmm. artist but that this music is about the human experience the, and human, the human desire experience. The human desire to be free. Um, yeah, you know one thing. One thing that really touched me um, as I was experiencing the album was the fact that it felt very culturally specific, but at the same time very multiple, which is something that is very difficult to achieve. You know, yeah. it's it's like it felt like it was grounded in a very specific cultural um, um, perspective, but it allowed for alt for other cultural, um, you know, experiences and perspectives to also coexist cohesively yeah. with it. Yes. And that to was, me, I that's, think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. That was uh, something that kind of happened mm -hmm. on its own, I think, once we yeah. sat together and we said, well, here's the archive. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I think that the thing that that captures that um, uh, that captures South Africa culturally is the archive, really, mm -hmm. because when you hear the sound of, for instance, there's an instrument called umkhope that you can hear at the beginning of a song called Sabela, which is the first song on the album. Um, that instrument is very much a Southern African instrument. It's a mouth bow with one string. And you kind of, kind of scratch it like that, and it makes mm -hmm. that scratching sound, and that's why it's called umkhope because it makes the sound, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that was the thing that really grounded the music in this South African ness. Um, but you know, I've always, always wanted to hear the kora, for instance what how it would respond and so being in Senegal and and, and watching the, the the Kora player or the Ngoni player um listening to the Umkhube and trying to find how they can respond how they can be in conversation for me that was just like that was the magic of of the album 
and 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 doing the same thing in New York as well. You know, mm-hmm. watching the drama, for instance, try to interpret um, a, a sample of a traditional um, drumming that comes from South Africa. You know, um, and just kind of trying to interpret that and see how they would fill in. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, for me, that that was really the magic of my experience of making this album was to really, um, I, I think, for me, this was my truly Pan-African album. I've always been a Pan-African artist in that I, I, I saw myself as an African of the entire continent, that, you know, I'm home wherever I am in, on the African continent. But this particular album, because because there was this um this physical traveling yeah um really brings together this pan african spirit and having michelle and this this stellar lineup of musicians also for me really began to have this conversation about this uh transatlantic um slave trade and mm-hmm. what was lost what has been retained, retained and what conversation we can have about that trauma, you know, what is, mm-hmm. because for me, you know, it's, it's, it's a very big trauma that we share yeah. as those people who were left at home and those who were taken, there's a trauma that we share. Yeah. Um, and while we were in the studio, I was really thinking about um, the idea of, of us, making this music together what does it mean for us to be in a room with the archive mm. in a room with you know um what would be quite an old archive mm-hmm. so um yeah that was for me the really fascinating part of this journey yeah. and uncovering this 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 sonic language this similarity this connectedness yeah, and I think you were very, very successful at it. I mean, we we just um were talking about that actually, and we were talking about how um in in some songs I could I could hear I could hear artists that um and and tonalities and sonics that I I am used to hearing because you know being from um Dakar Senegal and being born uh in in Burkina Faso like I grew up listening to folks like Rokia Traoré uh, Rokia Kone for instance or you know Abi Poete and I could hear in the way um that certain artists or certain musicians for instance use the acoustics um you know to complement the sounds that were at the foundation of the Absolutely. album felt so it, it felt like the work of an alchemist and the work of someone who was so intentional in revealing some of the connections that were, and I mean, like, I'm, you know, part of the other things that I do is, you know, I, I revel in memory work and, you know, yes. and in um, history specifically, because there is such an importance in, you know, uncovering, in uncovering where the fragmentations happen yeah. and you know, where we were able to essentially um, you know, heal some of those fragments versus where there is a lack. And that's that's also where there is the power of the diaspora yeah. because the way the way the Anglophones maybe or like, you know, the South Africans um um would do it is different than the way the Nigerians or the Malian would do it. And in yeah. the way South Africans were, were successful, for instance, you know, um Malians might need help and vice versa. So yeah. Such an important, such an important uh, moment, you know, musical moments, but also framework for those of us who are looking to see how to essentially heal the trauma that we've carried from a generational perspective. At least that's yeah. how I've received it. And my yeah, assumption is you. that it's 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 related to that's the reason why you you went yes. for the name of the album Sankofa. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's why I went for the name because yeah. uh, ultimately that's what what I was doing. I was collecting yeah. these fragments. Yeah. Um and and trying to put something back together, you know. Yeah. Um which I guess that's the work of, of any artist on the continent because mm-hmm. it's it's stuck to you when yeah. you are of the continent that there's there's so much that needs to be um reassembled. Yeah. Um so yeah, Sankofa is about that. It's about the idea of reclamation. Mm-hmm. Um and so um yeah I I found that 
in in traveling and using this archive, I was able to reclaim so many um so many things that reclaim so many um uh, uh, connections dots. connections mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um and really reclaim like I said earlier this my pan African identity yeah um. Right now, I mean, in South Africa, there's there's a lot of misunderstanding about mm. um, what it is to be an African versus a South African, and you mm -hmm. know, um, so it 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 became uh, very important to me to bring the, this Pan African identity back into the zeitgeist, especially for 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 South Africans, because um, a lot of our um, uh, our struggles now, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, the you know people who are at the very bottom, people who are struggling the most, are the ones who are also struggling with the idea of what is a border and mm -hmm. what is an illegal right. immigrant, right. and you know, and so it causes this kind of fear of people from other parts of Africa, and a, and a, and a kind of friction between that you know because people are struggling at the bottom of the barrel and really what has happened is that all the african um governments uh have neglected mm -hmm. you know the people and so um when you find people scattered all over the african continent with you know nowhere to live nowhere to go um no structures that will support them it's an indictment on all our african leadership Absolutely. And I wanted to really use this space to reclaim the fact that I am indeed an African and I'm home wherever I go on the African continent. And um, a Senegalese person can come to South Africa and be home, a Zimbabwean can be home, and that the struggles that we face internally should mm -hmm. not um, separate us from the extension of who we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm curious to know what led you to um look the pan-african way because as you said you know it's it's not it's not a given you know for for a lot of us on the continent sometimes we are um you know in our in our own i guess uh for our own sake we're sometimes a little self-absorbed in terms of what's happening within our country and so yeah. i'm wondering what led you to look I the pan-african pan way i guess it's you know i i grew up during apartheid Right, and right. my my parents were um part of the PAC, which is the Pan Africanist mm -hmm. Congress, which was a very mm -hmm. much a leftist party, mm -hmm. um that was very much Pan African in its ideology. So I grew up in a home that spoke these ideas of Pan Africanism. I, I grew I grew up reading you know Franz Fanon and yeah um reading you know Chinua Achebe and you know so it was this home environment that that fostered the idea that um that i was not only a struggling south african but that i could align myself with the free people of ghana the free people yes. of kenya the free people of tanzania because we were still we were still oppressed you know mm -hmm. and so this pan african ideal was really the idea of freedom that's what freedom meant to us that mm -hmm. we would reconnect and reconnect ourselves with the rest of the continent yeah um so i've i i guess i've always been raised in this idea um and sometimes it isn't a popular idea yeah um and sometimes it's not not only that it's not a popular idea maybe it's just not a, an idea that um is at the forefront yes but uh for me it always has been you know mm -hmm. we've always read the words of Kwame Nkrumah and so we've we've always wanted um this Africa that that was borderless, that yeah. had one currency, that owned its resources, mm -hmm. um, that could be the superpower that it really is, you know, because the world could never survive a day without Africa, you know. That's a word. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, even in, in just in the way that we see ourselves, you know, we always yeah. want to go outside first and then come back home, you know, and I just kind of, I, I've, I've always been, I've always been um, enamored by this idea of being all 
African, you know. Yeah. And that I that I that I can that I can take a word from Ghana and use it as as my own, and yeah. I can take and I can take these um Maasai beads and use them as my own, you yeah. know, um, and really claim myself as yeah. a person of 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 the entire continent. So, yeah, it's just it's kind of a part of my upbringing, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and over the years, uh, through traveling, traveling the continent, um, mm-hmm. there's there's no place like Africa. No yeah, way. no way like Africa. I concur. I concur. And and now, uh, um, I guess I'm. It brings me uh, back to a personal question that I have for you. And I mean, I I'm sure it's going to be relevant to you know, um, folks looking, uh, watching. But I mean, I was I'm I'm curious to know what what called you in, um to Dakar why Dakar, Dakar Senegal for instance and not not Guinea because I mean I know that you 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 know revere all things um uh, Mihama Keba for instance and I know yes. that you know Guinea is is was her second um home so in, in, intuitively I was thinking okay like West Africa Guinea Kora Ngoni Yes, but it's Dakar that you chose. It's Dakar that I chose. I think um a lot of it may have just been a logistical thing. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I um, see. You know, I initially I really wanted to go to Mali. You know, I mm-hmm. I really wanted to go and record with uh Babu Salif Keita at Mofu. Ah, we yes. had the same manager for many years. Um, mm-hmm. and so the plan was for me to really go to to Mali. Ah, Dakar. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yes, Dakar. <laughs> uh, so I I was really trying to arrive to to go to Bamako. I was trying to get mm-hmm. to Bamako, mm-hmm. um. But once my manager, my previous manager Chris, passed away, I kind mm-hmm. of didn't have any more roots into yeah. into Bamako, and it it's not a very easy place to get to, and mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, sometimes there's some uh, unrest. So you really need yeah. people in, you need to have family to take you around. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I have a lot of friends in Senegal who mm-hmm. it just kind of made it easy to facilitate. You know, I, mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I had people who could speak French on my behalf and uh, people who could take me to the best place for chicken yasa or, <laughs> you know um so i right. it, it really just became it became a, a place of of um convenience yeah but i really believe that all of these things happen because of some kind of serendipity Absolutely. Um, and uh senegal was really charmed the experience of being there for i think we had three days in the studio um mm. recording with a really incredible lineup of musicians and just having such um incredible evenings late into the night uh laughing and trying to understand each other's language and <laughs> uh, uh trying and I'm trying to find all the french that I can master <laughs> and I you know but right. just the beauty of that the beauty of of struggling yeah. together to find a common language and then suddenly when you step into the studio it's 5 minutes you know you're like wow i know how to do this wow you know so um senegal was really um it just turned out to be the best decision i would have yeah. loved to have gone to um to bamako yeah. um but i didn't get there you know, and I would have also loved to go to Ethiopia. I really wanted mm-hmm. to do some sessions in in Ethiopia because Ethiopia I wanted well. to, yeah, I wanted to find uh, um, uh, Baba Mulatu and see if I can get some sessions there. I wanted yeah. to do some sessions in in, in Nigeria even. Um, yeah. But these three points on the, on the globe yeah. really um, connected for me. And also... When you think about the fact that um, Senegal was one of the major ports for, yes, for slavery, you yes. know, so Boy. it was almost as though we were moving, uh, kind of doing this trip together, you know, yes. from mm-hmm. South Africa to this place, you know, that held all this trauma and all this strength and, and all this yeah. power and the history. Um, and then looking at that ocean and realizing that, you know, 
that's the root mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and then also and then ending up in new york city you know yeah. to do some sessions there so um it just made sense it would have been amazing to go to guinea i still dream of going to guinea to do a massive concert in tribute of mama makeba and the people of yeah. guinea for having taken care of her for mm-hmm. us when she had no home you know um but um i think very much like mama mire makeba i believe i feel at home everywhere on the continent so i i could i could make music anywhere Yeah and I mean I think that we're all very lucky that you do so because you know it transpires in the way you 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 show up you know um and also in the way uh your work um takes shape. Yeah. Thank you. That's amazing. No, that's amazing. Um I have one more question and uh, um we'll open it to the floor. But okay. um in in your in your um exploration exploration of memory work um I've, i've i've seen that in the album there are there are a couple speeches that are assembled and um i think that for for kunzima specifically um there was um uh some bites um where <laughs> i think people were saying honorable members honorable members and then there is the mention of anarchy and i loved it but i was so intrigued because i wanted to know what time in history was it i think it was a an assembly a little more yeah yeah I, um, yeah you wanted to know a little bit more <laughs> yeah i wanted um, to know a little more on like the process but that that one specifically but also the yeah. process in actually know, um is 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 gunzima called sorry i i had so many names for these songs that i can't remember mm-hmm. did it end up being called uh the unbearable blackness of being Does it say I that? No, I'm, I'm I don't think sure. so. I'm not sure, oh, but it's what it, is it? it it's basically it, so so it, okay. it sounded so mm-hmm, what ahead. it is is I mean I um this this I, this song is about dissatisfaction about political yes. dissatisfaction. Yeah. Um and about the fact that you know as South Africans we um I keep going back to this that I was born during apartheid and so I remember the moment of freedom. I remember mm-hmm. it, you know, I can I can hold it. Uh mm-hmm. and say this is the moment when I got my freedom, you know. And wow. that is quite a, a a crazy thing to think about, you know. Mm-hmm. And so um over the years of this freedom and these uh leaders that we've elected ourselves we've experienced a lot of political dissatisfaction we've experienced the sense that our dream has been deferred um we've also experienced the greed of of a politician you know that politicians yeah. can really um you know uh can really leave the people out in the cold yeah. you know um so those sound bites actually come from current the current parliament in south africa mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i'm kind of speaking to the anarchy that exists inside the, the the parliament while they fight to call each other honorable member <laughs> but you know, we we don't see anything honorable in honorable. them they've completely lost themselves they've lost the consciousness of what it is to be a leader to be a freedom fighter Yeah. and they started to play the game of politics which always um forgets the people yeah. so um yeah those are not from like an old archive they just come from now from the, these are the things parents. that happened in the past six months or the wow. past year so it's very current and i'm i think it's it's, it's a very direct conversation with uh, our government and the mm-hmm. politicians about um how dissatisfied we are and there yeah. are many songs like that in the album that speak directly to them um yeah. and uh, i had an interesting gig uh about two weeks ago because we had our mm-hmm. elections uh and then i was called to play at this closing dinner of the elections mm-hmm. where all the politicians of all the political parties would be there Mm-hmm. and uh, i got on the stage and i said to them well you know i have many songs that i could sing for you but i thought i should sing for you the songs that i sing for the people yeah. <laughs> and i said <laughs> so here we go <laughs> and uh, 
we we sang the song that calls them all thieves and you know, Ooh, we, I love we it. Were doing you know we, we did all the songs and really just kind of really attacked them because that's really how um we the people feel feel you know? um so yeah that's that's what that song is is you know we're using very I'm using very current sound yeah. bites. That's yeah. that's beautiful. Um, and someone just mentioned that it's um dark side of the rainbow, dark side of the rainbow. Of the sorry, rainbow. thank yeah. you. Because at, in the beginning, I I was going to call it the unbearable blackness of being, mm -hmm. and then I think in the end I called it uh the dark side of the rainbow. Yeah, and that speaks to this idea. I mean, you know, South Africa is called the rainbow nation. Yeah, that's how it, yeah, yeah, this yeah. freedom was marketed to us. It was sold to us as yes. Um, yeah. you know, it's a new new South Africa, and there's a rainbow nation that it that mm -hmm. includes all of us, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but you realize that you know there's no black first of all in the in the rainbow, yeah. <laughs> and then um, that there's a dark side to this. There's a yeah. side of it where the people are dissatisfied. We're not yeah. all rainbows and happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your question. I mean, your answers. Um, thank I'm going to open it to the floor now. Um, you know, for anybody who has questions that they would like to forward to the this one. Yeah, we have one. We have okay. one. Um, so I hope it's not a difficult question. I don't think so. No, <laughs> I won't. I won't pose. I won't bring these ones. I won't bring. I won't bring the <laughs> difficult ones. <laughs> Um, so Mirya Makeba has been an in inspiration to so many artists and listeners. Can you talk about the song with a love to Makeba and how she inspires you? Well, um, interestingly, when I started in the music industry, it was like the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And this is when Mama Mirya Makeba came home for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to watch her at this concert called... Um, I can't remember the night, the name now, uh. But I then we, I was part of a group called Bongo Muffin. Yes. And when Mama Makeba came home, we had done a remake of Pata Pata of her famous Pata Pata, and so I remember we were called to come and do a performance of Pata Pata for her. Um, and I was nineteen years old. I was wow. running around the African market looking for. <laughs> looking for something to buy for Mama Africa, you know? Oh. And I, I remember buying her a mask that I think at the, it could have come from West Africa, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so I really had the blessing of meeting all my, all my heroes when I was really yeah. young, you know, and having them guide me, you know? Mm -hmm. So Mama Makeba was one of my mentors when I was really young. She was someone I could call and ask about this or that. Um, and she was someone who would reprimand me if I, she thought I was doing something that would derail my career. Yeah. Um, and very often when she was asked, who do you think the next Miriam Akeba will be? She said me. Wow. And so I just, that's the world that I grew up in. I grew up in, in this world where Miriam Akeba, Huma Sikela, Letambulu, yeah. Kaifa Semenya, all these people, Salif Keita, were all in my radar, in my space. And so the influences were quite um, real to me, you know, mm -hmm. because I I was able to sit down with Mama Makeba and I, I actually remember her, it was a question that she asked me. Uh, I was 19 years old. It was at that first performance we did in front of her. And she asked me, she said, what kind of artist do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And as a 19-year-old, I had not thought about the answer to that. Mm -hmm. And it was that question that really was the impetus to um, the kind of artist I became because I then realized that I wanted to be an artist that would have um, a social, what's the word? I guess that would be conscious of the things that are happening, woke mm -hmm. to the things that are happening around me, mm -hmm. and an artist that would represent the times. Mm -hmm. um, so Mira Makeba was really instrumental for me because, you know, I guess she asked me one of the most important questions, and it has always guided 
um, everything that I do. Wow. I mean, I can only imagine to have somebody like this on on your corner. I mean, such a giant of 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 music, of African music, of music globally, you know, yeah, seeing I mean, you. Yeah, I, it, sometimes when I think back to mm -hmm. what has happened to me in the past 30 years, I almost can't believe it. You know, I can't believe yeah. that I could pick up my phone and speak to Huma Sikela, you know, wow. that... Um, I, that Huma Sikela would call my name in every room that he was in anywhere wow. in the world. I mean, I ended up on tour with uh, Paul Simon doing the second um, Graceland tour. Mm -hmm. And that was really because Huma Sikela called my name, you know. Uh, so I, I really just kind of had this charmed, yeah, you know, life. <laughs> where things <laughs> where things were just really um incredible and I had access to so many of my heroes and yeah they really taught me how um about about generosity they taught mm -hmm. me uh, the importance of generosity of of not being so wrapped up in the idea that you are um special you know mm. Mm. But um, using your gift as to, to, to be of service, mm -hmm. using your gift as an instrument of your service wow. to humanity. No, yeah. that 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 is so beautiful. And it's it's so important. I mean, it sounds to me that, you know, these are people who saw you um, at the beginning of your career, at the beginning of your own making, and they, they nurtured your light. You know, yeah, instead they, of they did. It. And they really spoke, spoke into it, really. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they wrote me letters, you know, I, I remember a letter that Huma Sigela wrote to me where he said, you have the ability to become one of the most important voices of your generation. This was 30 years ago wow. that Brahu wrote me this letter. And today that has really become true of my experience as a South African artist in South yeah. Africa, you know. Yeah. So they really spoke life into yeah. into me um yeah. and and now i realize the, the importance of that and i try to do it for a lot of young people now you know mm -hmm. to to see them to see them beyond um their youth or beyond their um naivety you know mm -hmm. but to mm -hmm. see what is possible because brahu mm -hmm. saw me brahu mama mira makeba they all saw me when i was uh I didn't even know how to to use my voice. Yeah, I yeah. was still trying to find it, and they they said, "You've got it, baby." You got <laughs> oh it. wow, <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow! That yeah. is such a blessing. I mean, and it's a blessing that we're still benefiting from because I mean, you know, look at the work that you're putting out, um, and how it's impacting people, people like me, people you know, even beyond me, people who precede me, people who who will come after me. That really yeah. is. The beauty of art and you know the, the beauty of your consistency throughout the years that's that's at least how i perceive it um we have we have one question that's actually related to what you just shared which is what advice would you give to to young artists um it's it's it seems you know i think when you're a young person this is a very difficult thing to do mm. but it is to be yourself yeah to trust your own voice and your yeah. own ideas yeah. and to remember that as a young person your ideas are the ones that are going to change the world so mm -hmm. be as radical as you as as you can be mm -hmm. as different as you can but i would I, I would say yeah be you be who you are yeah um sometimes you know like uh, i especially when you're an african kid you're thinking okay maybe i should sing in english so that yeah. people can, you know, there's things like that, you know, and I'm just like, you know, if you want to sing in your own language, sing in your own language, people will mm -hmm. catch up to what the meaning is, They'll, the mm -hmm. resonance. It's all about resonance, not really yeah. translation. So, yeah, be yourself, trust your voice, trust your own ideas and be um, fearless. Wow. What a beautiful way to end this interview that I wish I didn't have to end. <laughs> ah, thank you. Thank oh. you very much.